Aloha. My name is Dr. Dean Nelson, and thank you for watching Planet of the Courageous. In the Tibetan tradition, it is thought we pick to be born on this planet to courageously face our fears, anxiety, and insecurities. By facing and leaning into our fear and our insecurities with courage, and it does take bravery, we learn that on the other side of these challenges is our innate wisdom and compassion. In the Hawaiian paradigm, you could say we are built from aloha. With this aloha in our hearts and mind, we can skillfully and courageously benefit our communities and the world all together. Today, I'm pleased to have a brother from another mother with us. He walks his talk, having focused his life work as a lawyer speaking for the underprivileged and advocating mediation and listening from the other person's point of view versus being right and adversarial. As a young lawyer fresh out of Notre Dame, he became a fellow of the Robert Kennedy Memorial Foundation, a cadre of lawyers who are a sort of Peace Corps of lawyers asked to serve our underprivileged and the indigenous First Nations people. He worked as a lawyer for the Lakota Sioux in South Dakota and the Upiat in Alaska. He hails literally from the streets of Little Italy in the 50s, which was a setting that the movie Godfather was based on. Through a circuitous uh, journey documented in his very readable autobiography book, Peacemaking, a Sicilian American memoir, he was drawn to the mixing pot of our beautiful Hawaii. Aloha, Tom. Aloha, brother. <laughs> All right. And you got Sicilian right. I'm very proud uh, of you. Thank you for the tutelage on that. <laughs> Let's do um, one breath for ourselves and one breath for mankind. Mm -hmm. Just start the piece right here, breath. Let's hope for our world, huh, brother? Right, I can feel my bogus nerve coming down. <laughs> yeah. Tom, it's just such an interesting read, the, the memoir that you wrote. And you hail from Little Italy, and you describe it as a pretty uh, dysfunctional and violent uh, place. So in a thumb sketch, kind of tell us how you uh, came to peacemaking as your, as your life's work. Well, when you say dysfunctional, that's quite true. Um, violence was a daily occurrence. Uh, if you were a student like I was and serious about your studies, uh, you had to dodge the bullies, uh, people who would shake you down and uh, just beat you up for the hell of it. And when you grow up in a culture like that, um, as a young boy, uh, especially with a father, like the kind of father that I had who was a peacemaker, and came from a tradition of uh, peacemaking that went back to our ancestral roots in Sicily. Um, my father would always point out that there was another way and would demonstrate that, walk the talk himself. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I had that influence. And then on the other side, of course, there was the dysfunction in the streets, but there was the highly functional family unit. And so I had tremendous support from, uh, and I was probably the youngest of all the cousins uh, mm -hmm. in the extended family. Uh -huh. So I had all of that support of generations of people behind me, just coaching me, pushing me, uh, fathering and mothering me uh -huh. uh, to lead the life of a peacemaker. And so it was ingrained pretty early on that there was another way. There was another way, meaning adversarial fighting, violence, right. always being right. right. Uh-huh, top-down. Yeah, might makes right. <laughs> yeah, might yeah. makes right. Yeah. Wonderful. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we talked about on the way down here was quite a powerful moment for you with a very infamous or famous lawyer named Ray Cohen. Roy. Roy Cohen. Roy Cohen. Who is actually, turns out to be a lawyer for another famous person, um, President Trump. Number 45, yes. Number 45. <laughs> And uh, it, but there was a moment when you were seven and you actually visited him with your mother, I believe, to try to plead a case for a cousin. That tr kind of was the seminal thing where some light went off and said, I'm going to protect the underprivileged. Can you talk about that? Well, what's cool about writing uh, your memoir is that you get to revisit those experiences. Yeah. And the psychologists call it a, uh, a, um, a, a moment that, uh, uh, that's called a flashbulb experience mm -hmm. that's imprinted on you for the rest of your life. Yeah, it's, and the brain uh, memorizes Absolute, it that way. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. It doesn't and I, do time. It and does. just as we're talking, mm -hmm. I, I go 
right back to that room in the mm -hmm. federal courthouse That's in New something. York. Yeah. So um, no one in my family uh, had gone beyond the eighth grade uh, of my father and mother's generation. And they had been raised with Sicilian as their first language. And uh, however, my mother always had kind of the mouth in the family and was the articulate one and, and had the nerve, as they said. And so <laughs> when my uncle was arrested on uh, uh, probably, he was among the worst counterfeiters in the whole world. They counterfeited some money that looked like Monopoly money, you know. <laughs> And um, he was arrested, and it, um, it, he was a young man, had never been in trouble before with the uh -huh. police. But his older brother, my, my older uncle, uh, had been in and out of jail and was kind of a wise guy and so forth, and kind of influenced his younger brother. But So the younger brother got caught, okay, and that's an interesting story in Chapter 1. Yeah. And, um, and so uh, he, in those days, there was no public defenders. We right. couldn't afford any counsel for him or right. anything. So my mother went down. Uh, he, made, he entered a plea, and, and they were awaiting sentencing. Uh -huh. And so my mother was sent by the family to go down and, and, and plead for mercy for her brother, her kid brother. And you, you traipse in and, and, and get... Um Get brought in front of this Roy Cohen this Roy, statement. This little uh, right. Little, I see you kind of being dragged along. On well, and my mother said we're going on an educational field trip, right? So she takes me down uh, to the Wall Street area in Manhattan, and we go to the federal courthouse. We wait what seemed like to, to be an inordinate uh, amount of time, to, to, uh, even though we had a scheduled appointment. Uh -huh. We get ushered in. Uh, to make a long story short, it's Roy Cohn. Of course, uh, people of our generation might remember him. He right. was uh, he was counsel to, to McCarthy during the McCarthy hearings. Th then there's a movie about him. And there was a movie Al Pacino starred in. Right. right. I mean, he was fierce. It's a very dark, uh, among the fiercest. Uh, right. And he was the, turned out in, in later years, the mentor for Donald Trump, uh -huh. and also Trump's attorney for about 10 or 20 years. Okay, I'm gonna leave that one go. We'll let it go. We'll let that one go, yeah. just because it would not end for a while. Right. But there, there are flashpoints in your life, and another flashpoint that's been in my life and that uh, you, you referred to, and I was really um, stunned or pleased or happy, was Wounded Knee and uh, the Lakota uh, tribe all together, because I was in Minneapolis when the AIM movements mm -hmm. first started. And here we are again, protecting a pipeline with the same people in the same place. And, and, and Wounded Knee, and that well, I think was 1973. Right. Uh, you met a senator, Senator... I, I was doing work for Senator Aberesk off and on. He was right. the senator from South Dakota, where I had been stationed right. as a Kennedy Fellow. Right. And I had just finished my fellowship the year before, right. when I was called to service by one of the Oglala Tribal Council people. Uh -huh. Uh, and that's how I got involved at Wounded Knee. And you actually said in the book that you thought he should have gotten his own reward. At one point, this gentleman, Senator Abbasek, Abbasek. Abbasek, actually stands up in front of the FBI who are about to have an armed confrontation with American Indians who are occupying their land right. in hopes of uh, changing some of the politics that are going on. Right. And he actually says, uh, giving you the line, do you, do you want to be the first uh, first federal agent to kill a working senator in the yeah, history of the United States? Right. And he backed them down. He did. He did. You know, uh, John Kennedy wrote a book, Profiles in Courage, right. uh, early on in his career. Right. Uh -huh. And I always felt that Aberest should have been included in, yeah, that's, in that that's book at a later time because of that. Yeah. Let's focus on that a little more, though, because uh, there's almost like a nation within a nation and a uh, story a story, an abject story, we've called it, of what life is like on the reservation for our people. And we, we, on the way down, we chatted and said, if you had exposure, it's actually worse than any third world country. So how do you see that we're going to bring peacemaking to the wonderful First Nation people that we inherited our country from? How do we make peace here on this? Well, I think first we have to make peace within ourselves. And, Beautifully said, Tom. And, and understand uh, it's peace within, peace without. Mm -hmm. And we're a very violent people in America. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we basically stole the land uh, mm -hmm. and have occupied the land of Native Americans now for centuries. We broke every treaty just about that was ever signed before the ink was dry, literally. Painful but true. Right. And, uh, and then, of course, we had slavery on top of that, mm -hmm. and we had the immigrants, uh, and through their labor, this country was built and occupied and settled. And how do you do it? 
I mean, it's a massive undertaking. I go back now to my, my period of service in the uh, early 70s through the mid 70s, basically through the 70s in that part of the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you go and look at the statistics today for Shannon County, for instance, where the Ogallala Reservation is and where I, I, I did a lot of work, mm -hmm. um, they're worse than ever. Worse than ever. Worse than ever. The suicide rate is epidemic proportions, particularly among young people. And, um, and yet, I think both of us agree, although the history that you paint is, is a, true, a true painting, it's an amazing experiment, this experiment of America. Mm -hmm. So again, how, how do you, what tools do you see that are pragmatic for this peacemaking, for people to be somewhat self-reflective of how to move the bar ahead? Well, you know, uh, Buddhist philosophy, among other Eastern philosophies, uh, talks about nonviolence. Okay, mm -hmm. as uh, in yoga philosophy, for instance, ahimsa is the number one uh, moral precept. Mm -hmm. If you if you don't if you don't figure that one out, then really, uh, no matter how many postures you twist yourself into, right, 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 right. and how many deep breaths you're able to take, uh, uh -huh. it really doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. you know? So um, we have to realize that we're violent people. We have to start, mm -hmm. I think, where uh, um, uh, President Clinton started, which was with a formal apology, okay, mm -hmm. on behalf mm -hmm. of the nation, and, and then reconciliation, education, a martial plan for the reservations. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the rate of alcoholism, the, the deplorable nature, and the Lakota in particular, and that's why this pipeline thing is, is so interesting. Mm -hmm. They resisted uh, the American military right to the end mm -hmm. until really there was, there was not an adult male left mm -hmm. uh, in their tribe. They were either old men, some women, mm -hmm. and uh, very young children. And um, they've been paying the price ever since, hmm. ever since. Okay, and so it's it's huge. The undertaking is huge. I don't pretend to have the answer, but the basic core thing, and again, this comes out of Buddhist philosophy, mm -hmm. is to really learn how to listen. Mm -hmm. uh, as my uh, Yupik mentors in Alaska educated me, mm -hmm. they said the, 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 the um, creator gave you two ears and one mouth. <laughs> so you should, at a minimum, listen twice as much as you speak. Well, For a young lawyer, that was a very interesting advice. Yeah, there it was, two to one. And then on the listening part of it, it seems even before listening is the quieting of our minds. Yes. Because you just can't quiet, if, you, if your mind's always going for the retort of how smart you're going to be, and it hasn't taken that first breath like we did, just like, right. okay, what's really here? What's, right. what's really in our hearts? Right. That's actually quite a brave move. Right. I mean, to ask, and you're asking people to do that before they talk, to actually touch base with their hearts, that's a pretty stunning thing. Yeah. Can it be done? I hope so in my lifetime. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, um, I think that's why some of us are here, to help promote that. Uh, Absolutely. You yeah. know, those right. of us who have discovered that in our own lives, um, want to share it, and that's and that's your obligation if you've discovered it. Your responsibility is to share that. Don't you feel so? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to come back in just a second here, Tom, and I'm going to ask you some more questions. So I think we got a break coming up right now. Terrific! I okay. can't wait. All right, here we go. Aloha. I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at kawilucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. Aloha and haoli makahiki ho, which is Happy New Year, and I hope it's a happy and prosperous new year for you. I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute. Every week we partner with Think Tech Hawaii and produce a program called Ehana Kako. Let's work together. We bring together movers and shakers who are making a difference here in Hawaii, making a better Hawaii for everyone. If you're interested in improving the economy, the government, and society, join us every week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. for Ehana Kako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Until you see me then, aloha. Tom, what, what motivates you? I mean, this has been a wild life that you've lived. It's not been based on making dough. I mean, 3,800 per year as a lawyer for the fellowship, for mm -hmm. Robert, uh, Robert Kennedy's fellowship. Uh, let's go into what really motivates you as a human being. What's 
What's the core keel there of the North Star for you? Well, you know, it really ties into a very current issue, which is immigration. So mm -hmm. my ancestors um, came to this country and worked very hard, as most immigrants do, established themselves, and basically left everything that they knew and cherished in order to provide a life for future generations, my generation, um, in which we could um, get an education, become professionals, um, and uh, lead a life that wasn't tied to starvation on a daily basis. And because of that and all the sacrifices that those ancestors made on my behalf, I feel the obligation is to return that energy as best I can um, and help others any way I can. For as long as I can, wherever I can, wherever, uh, whatever I can do. Yeah. Jimmy Carter. Good. Beautiful quote. Right? Yeah. yeah. Beautiful man. Yeah. Beautiful man. Yeah. So I'm going to do some a little more playful stuff, if we don't mind. What, what makes you feel lucky to live Hawaii? Ah, wow. Uh, I would say the Aloha spirit. Uh, to be surrounded by, um, generally speaking, by uh, people who are kind, people who are polite, people who are respectful. Uh, and people who I seem to feel more comfortable with than I've felt any other place on the planet. So your community, your sangha, the, yeah. the Aloha spirit, as yeah. you said. Right. How would you define happiness? Happiness, uh, in one word, family. And that's family both in terms of your immediate family, your blood family, your community, and the family that we live with on this beautiful little jewel of a planet that's speeding on through space. So see everybody as Ohana. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, if you had a magic wand and you could erase one disease in life, what would it be? Ignorance. Stupidity, ignorance. Ignorance. Mm -hmm. it, it, uh, ignorance in the, in the sense that you uh, encounter it in Buddhism and in yoga philosophy, mm -hmm. okay, which is ignorance of the self. Mm -hmm. Not knowing who you are, why you are, what your purpose in life is, and what your service, your siva is. Yeah, beautifully said. Yeah, that is what Buddha said. That the root cause of this is that we ignore that we're connected to everything, that we're actually built from beautiful stuff. Yeah, I think we have the same word in yoga philosophy and, and in Buddhism, it's uh, avi avidya. Avidya, yeah. yeah, stupidity or ignorance. The ability to ignore your connections, right. your, how you are all one in some sense, right. and not separate. And what, did, you know, when you were a little kid, I'm kind of curious, what, what did you want to be in life? Uh, it, it always was the lawyer. Okay. Really? The advocate, yeah. Always, uh, always. Always the advocate. Well, that, you know, st that experience at seven, like I said, it was a searing, almost like a branding. Mm -hmm. And it's a, mix, it's a mixed blessing. A very mixed blessing. Because on the one hand, my course was charted, and, it's, and when you have a purpose in life, and mm -hmm. you have a focus and a goal, right. okay, it, in some ways, it makes whatever your ambitions are for yourself a lot easier. On the other hand, uh, there might have been some other things that uh, I, 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 I don't say I regret, but it would have been interesting to look into, more of an academic career, for instance. You know, I was kind of curious, because there's so many um, titles that would apply to you now. I mean, there's author, there's lawyer, there's musician, there's athlete, there's cook. <laughs> there's a lot of, a lot of different, uh, lot of different social activists. What, What's important to you right now again? Let's read. Being the best human being I can be. Beautifully said. Beautifully. I mean, that, that's that is, what I that's left. It's a work in progress, of course. Uh huh. And the imperfections are glaring and daily. Mm hmm. Uh, but that's one of the beautiful things about family is that you have that looking glass. You have that mirror reflecting back from your other family members, particularly your, what the UPIC would call your IPA, your soulmate which is my wife, Louise. And you, you lucked out there. Yeah. Not, yeah. not lucked out. Yeah. You deservingly well, got a beautiful we, mate. 40-year right? 40, 40 relationship, 40-plus year mm -hmm. relationship, still going mm -hmm. strong. And mm -hmm. so to have that mirror in your life, even though sometimes it pisses you off, you know, <laughs> to have a good hard look at yourself. You think? <laughs> <laughs> but on the whole, uh, it's a very salutary thing. Right. I, I was curious in a book, you, Life in Little Italy in Manhattan, uh, Notre Dame, Indiana, South Dakota, Lakota tribal lands, Bethel, Alaska, the U Upiat, uh native lands, Santa Barbara, Evansville, 
uh, Washington, D.C., uh, Lanikai, Hawaii, and you kind of describe yourself as a stranger in a strange land. How, how does that feel now, or what is that like looking back? Oh, I want to use your word. Your autognosis. Right. The autognosis of your life. What do you know about your life now? Or is it still that stranger in the strange land feeling? Not so much. Only, you know, when I get off at the airport in Los Angeles or New York, uh, that's when the strangeness uh, sometimes comes in. But less strange. I think as one matures and gets older and um, you become more practical in nature, and seeing the good in everyone and not being so judgmental about others, uh, that helps to take the edge off of all of that. I think when I m made that statement uh, and felt that way, uh, perhaps I had some of the arrogance of youth uh, involved uh, in that statement. In what way, Tom? I'm not sure. Uh, the thinking that uh, that you're that you know more than others, oh, uh, that everybody, you know, oh, that's uh, oh, stupid, oh, right, you know, right, right, right. Uh, and, and so it forth. It is nice to have that one gone, yeah. <laughs> or at yeah. least partly. It's a big relief. <laughs> partly polished. <laughs> <a> big relief <laughs> by humanity. Right. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. So that's a, that's great. Just getting more humble, I think. You know, and the aging process will be, will do that to you, whether you like it or not. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's get a little bit more flesh on the bones because you're you're still you're working in divorce now. I mean that's been your um, bread and butter, you could say, mm -hmm. or how you focus your life in terms of peacemaking and right. mediating. Go through the kind of mechanics of the thing, how somebody comes to you, and how they're gonna how that's gonna look differently than an adversarial relationship. I don't know if you remember, you brought me this concept almost 20 years ago and asked me to partake as a physical and acupuncturist and a right. meditation, you asked me to also, and I was stunned. I think at that point the divorce rates were like at a third. So a, a third of everybody who tries this game called- It's 50% now. I, I don't know the actual stat, stat, but he's a little less. But anyway, it's a stunning amount and it affects the entire culture because, especially if there's children, your family never goes away. It isn't like you can- Right. Adios. So, Right. Talk us through the mechanics and why you think it's a superior way and where you would like to see collaborative law go all together. Well, there's two things. So the, the actual program that I have at the Mediation Center, Winwood Oahu, is uh, called Educated Divorce. Mm -hmm. And the approach there is that if most people are reasonable, especially if you can provide them um, uh, with a moment in time where they take that deep breath like we did at the beginning of the, of the outset of this program, mm -hmm. And, and ask their permission to be their guide, to be their educator, provide them with uh, information, for instance, about the brain, how they need to, to be realize uh, that when they're in a fight or flight situation, when they're being defensive, they're not listening. They may be physically hearing the words of the other person, the position of the other person, the needs of the other person, mm -hmm. but they're not really listening. They're preparing their defense. Right, 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 right. Uh, you know, right. so you have to help them shift from the back brain, okay, the limbic brain, to the right. prefrontal cortex, all right, uh, which is the more intellectual side, right. where reason generally, more reason generally resides. So you're going from the reptilian to the mm -hmm. highest functioning part, mm -hmm. the executive functions of the brain. So you do that through education. Uh, I use uh, breathing exercises. Um, my other profession is as a yoga teacher, as mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I use a lot of breath work uh, to get people to slow down, uh, to get people to listen to their heart more. Uh, and then there's all kinds of techniques like nonviolent communication, training mm -hmm. in nonviolent communication, mm -hmm. where, where the participants allow the peacemakers, the mediators, to interrupt them in their conversations and suggest better word usage. You want to you want to create what I call uh, consequence sensitive um, verbalization. Okay, so that you become. Um, uh, sensitive and conscious of the words that you're using because that's another form of violence, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, violence isn't just physical. Most right. of the violence that's committed is, is non-physical. Mm -hmm. So you're teaching people the words that they're saying, that they're choosing to use, how they're saying it, their body language, the intonations. So there's training involved in all of that. And then you have a team of professionals, just like mm -hmm. when you talked about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, we have that now. So I have psychologists. My daughter's just joined us now as an in-house sci PhD psychologist, mm -hmm. a PsyD psychologist, I should say. Um, and you use financial planners. 
if there's issues, uh, if people are in disagreement about alimony or just confused about alimony and division of property. Because in the divorce field, there's only two major issues. It's money and children. Money and the kids. Oh. And then the thing that I hammer, which comes out of my background, you ask me what's the thing that makes you the most happy, and I said family, right, mm -hmm. is to remind people if, if there are children, and most of the cases I have, there are children. Yes that it's all about the children and that I will, and I tell people up front this, that my mantra, if they're going off course and are getting away from the children's needs mm -hmm. versus their own selfish needs, because divorce is a very selfish experience, it's very narcissistic, okay, very worried about yourself, and people will give lip service and say, oh yeah, my children are everything to me, and then they'll go off and fight or uh -huh. yeah, just go uh -huh. totally loony uh, in terms of resolving the issues that need to be resolved. So my mantra will be children, children, remember the children, children, children. remember the children. Way to go, Tom. Remember in your book, Bernard Shaw's quote about family being the greatest service that can be rendered to any country and then kindness to bring up a family well. So you mentioned Lou, she's been doing yoga. You've been doing yoga out of Lanikai for almost, for 40 years. She's been doing 40 hours. She's been working in the prison for 24. I want to give you a moment to, is there something you would like to add or something? Well, our yoga school, which is called the Yoga School of Kailu, mm -hmm. our, our DBA is the Hawaii Yoga Prison Project. And for 24 years, Louisa and on occasion myself and some other of, of our yoga students have gone in to teach yoga inside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it's an amazing program. The transformations that you see among, among the uh, inmates in general, not everybody, but is, and they look forward to it. Um, she's the queen over there. I mean, everybody loves Lulu. Yeah. But we've gotten little or no support. The state, uh, the state has been kind enough uh, now to, uh, to pay for uh, to some of the classes. Mm -hmm. But we need to expand it. Uh, we need to pass the baton to a new generation yes. now to go uh -huh. in there. Uh -huh. um, and um, no one's interested in inmates. Uh -huh. They're they're forgotten. It is a stunning, you know, as I teach meditation at, this, at the prisons, and it's just stunning uh, how backwards we are right now. There's no other word for it. It's just to, I'm afraid we have to close right now. Um, brother from another mother, thank you so much for sharing your good words. And in departing, I want to say uh, be kind, uh, be courageous, do some good, and uh, have fun. And thank you, Tom, so much for sharing your time. My great, Beautiful my great, answer. my great pleasure, and uh, my motto is: if it ain't fun, better left undone. I like that one. Okay. Okay. <laughs>